Alan is, uh, is one of the founders of Red Nation. It's an organization formed in 2014 out of a desire to contribute to the widespread resurgence of strong vocal and organized efforts that are addressing the marginalization and invisibility of indigenous struggles within mainstream society. Melanie holds a PhD in American Studies from the University of New Mexico, and she has held numerous research fellowships and awards, including a University of California President's Postdoctoral Fellowship and an Andrew Mellon Dissertation Fellowship, and a Ford Foundation Diversity Predoctoral Fellowship. Please welcome Melanie Lassie. Could bring this down a bit shorter. Yat e Yat e shik e da shit ne sh e melani yazin sh belagana nishlema ade shkijni bashes chin belagana da shit yerl tchutsoni da shit nala baho gere de na shakot a stalden nishle. Hello, my name is Melanie Yazi. I am on my mother's side, I'm white, Scotch-Irish mix. Uh, my father's side, my paternal grandmother's clan is Montanesh Kijni. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. It's Coyote Pass clan, it's also Hamas Pueblo clan for Diné people. And on my paternal grandfather's side, I am Trotsoni or Big Water. So water is in my name and in my blood. This is how I identify myself as a Diné woman. Um, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It's always strange to hear um, people describe the things that you do. Um, and that you achieve. Uh, I really want to thank Alicia specifically for inviting me, but then also the board um, for ATOM. This is my first time here. Uh, I can't believe I didn't know that this association existed uh, two weeks ago because I am a travel historian. Um, I finished my PhD last year and I was trained under Jennifer Nez Dennettdale, who is the first Dene person to ever receive a PhD in history, in the entire history of the US Academy, um, about 20 years ago. And so I represent sort of a new generation in carrying the tradition of tribal historians forward, and I'm gonna talk about that tonight. Uh, so, I have my little outline here. For those of you who are here for the 215 session um, that Alicia was really kind to invite me to as well, I was in there with Hayes Lewis, who's a really important figure in the history of um, sort of Zuni, tribal, Zuni Pueblo tribal politics, but also he was my boss for a while when he was doing incredible work at the Center for Lifelong Education at IEIA up in Santa Fe. Um, I gave a rather academic paper. Um, I used a lot of jargon, uh, which is I, theoretical word, words, which I actually enjoy doing. Um, but tonight here for closing comments, I am gonna do what a good tribal historian does, and I'm gonna tell some stories. And I'm not gonna read a paper, but I'm going to draw my remarks and the larger significance in my comments about what I see as tribal history and what's really important about being a tribal historian and what differentiates tribal history and why it's really important in this moment where we're really fighting for our lives um, against resource extraction um, to reinforce sovereignty and all of the other things that indigenous peoples are struggling for and that I think Standing Rock really represented and that we're carrying forward. So, I, uh, you know, part of the reason also why I didn't want to read a paper and why I wanted to present myself as a tribal historian in a certain way is because, as some of you may know for Diné people, um, our leaders traditionally and historically, I'm not talking about window rock governance, I'm talking about how we used to govern ourselves, right, unmediated by sort of a centralized system of governance and what we might consider statehood, is that to be a good Diné leader, to be somebody who was respected, you had to persuade people publicly through your skills of speaking. Right, And so it was your ability to speak from your heart, it was your ability to speak with passion about things that really matter to people. And so I am testing those skills of mine tonight <laughs> in front of you, and you are the public that gets to judge whether or not I <laughs> sink or swim in my ability to do that because that's how we are as Diné people. That's how we judge each other, that's how we determine leadership, that's how we determine if something is convincing and speaks to our hearts and into our minds in a relevant way. So, I told you I was going to tell you a couple of stories. I want to tell a couple of stories. 
The first one is actually about the person I'm replacing tonight, who is supposed to be standing up here and talking to you, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard. So, the reason why I'm going to tell this story is because it relates to the overall, kind of the overarching comments I want to make about relationality and tribal history. I met LaDonna in January of this year. Um, the Red Nation, which is basically a grassroots, we consider ourselves a movement for indigenous liberation from colonialism and capitalism, so we're very radical in the work that we do. Uh, and my husband, Nick Estes, is a tribal historian himself. He's from the uh, Oyate, or the Lower Burl Sioux people um, that live right along the Missouri River. Of course, we know that when Standing Rock was really taking off in the fall of 2016, that effort was to protect the river. So Lake Oahe is really just a reservoir that was created by the Army Corps of Engineers, but that's actually the river, the Missouri River. Um, uh, Mini, Mini Shoshe, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Gotta make my in-laws proud. Um, but my husband is a tribal historian, a Lower Burl Sioux tribal historian. And so when that struggle was really taking form, though the Red Nation really felt uh, the call to action was very important for us to respond to. We started in Albuquerque here. We do a great deal of work here in the American Southwest. Um, and so we haven't done a lot of work in the Great Plains. But because my husband, Nick, is a tribal historian, he's from the Ocheti Shankowi, or the Great Sioux Nation, which was the nation that was calling on people to come and support them um, in their struggle to end, to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline and to stop it from crossing underneath Manisho Shere, the Missouri River. It seemed like our obligation, right? And I think a lot of people felt that to go up there and assist with that struggle. And so we spent a lot of time and effort. Um, I mean, we really gave everything that we had over the course of about the six months when that struggle was really going strong from about August to February, August 2016 to February 2017. And I didn't meet LaDonna at Sacred Stone when we were out there physically, um, but I got to meet her during the opening at Sundance Film Festival of the Rise documentary. How many of you have seen the Rise documentary, Standing Rock 1 and 2, about Standing Rock? Ooh, it's a small crowd. Okay, so go see that movie. Um, it, it was produced by Viceland, and it was uh, filmed, uh, filmed and produced by an entirely indigenous crew, mostly indigenous women. But if in Standing Rock 2, which is sort of the political, the historical arc of why Standing Rock happened, why it came into existence, and why it became what it did, Nick and LaDonna, my husband Nick, and LaDonna, who's a tribal historian, right, from Standing Rock, they both are in that documentary. And I had, I was consulted and I was watching the film, um, some of this, what do they call those, before they actually released the film. So trying to give some input on kind of the arc and the narrative that was being offered in the film. And I was, I, I, after I watched the film, it was both Nick and I, we were in our living room. Um, we now live in Southern California because that's where my, my job is at the University of California, Riverside. We were watching the film and about the hour and a half went by and I, I was sitting there and I felt so, I was crying because what I saw was Nick and LaDonna, who did not know each other at that time when they were both being filmed, to be in the Rise documentary, provided the literal backbone, the narrative, the history that really anchors how we understand the struggle in Standing Rock from an Ochenti Shakoi perspective, right? And so it's from the history of their own nation that the two of them came together in this film and it was interwoven in a really beautiful way to provide the backbone of the narrative and, and for all of the rest of us to understand that struggle and why that struggle was so important. And so in, fast forward to January 2017 at the Sundance Film Festival when the Rise, Doc, Rise um, documentary series was being uh, what, premiered, that's the word, uh, being premiered at Sundance. I got to meet, Nick and I both got to meet LaDonna for the first time. And there's parts of the story I can't tell, because I'm not a tribal historian from Wachati Shakoi, and only certain people are allowed to hear parts of the story. But the gist of it is that LaDonna and Nick sat down at a table, and they talked history. They talked the history of their people, and they found out that their names, so Nick's ceremonial name, which I can't say here in public, and LaDonna, the name Brave Bull, actually in English, was a name they both shared. And so they discovered through the telling of tribal history from the perspective of who they are as Ochete Shalkoni tribal historians, that there were literally two sides to the same spirit, two sides to the same historical figure who had been so important in the history of their people. And it was, it was like this sort of prophetic, amazing moment where we all realized, like, wow, here you guys were in this documentary. You had no idea that you, either of you existed and that you had this like, very intimate relationship with each other but that it was through that relationship, right, being two sides to the same 
the same sort of spirit and the same engine, the force that drives their tribal history forward, that they were able to anchor the story of the Rise documentary and the struggle at Standing Rock. And so that's my first story, talking about relationality, because I think tribal history is about relationality, and that it's the coming together, right, through our stories, because they're not just stories, they're actual histories of why we exist in the world, why we interpret things the way that we do. And so Nick and LaDonna are the, the same side of the same history, right, that they keep going, and that the struggle at Standing Rock is one, uprising, if you will. It's an intifada, is what a Palestinian friend <laughs> described it as. It's not a movement, but it's an uprising, I think, and a growing movement. So the second story I want to tell um, is about my own clan, my own ke, as we call it, uh, in the Diné language. So I identified myself earlier. My paternal grandmother's clan is Ma'inlishkizhni, which is traditionally sort of known as the Hamas Pueblo clan. And our clans, if for those who don't know, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a historian of our clans. And so my Diné relatives in the audience, feel free to correct me. I'm totally fine with that. But Ma'ale Shkizhni and a lot of our other clans actually derive from our relationships, Diné people's relationships with Pueblo people throughout history. And so we have four original clans, as many people know, and we now have many, many more. I'm actually not sure of the number, but it's, it's much larger, many, many times larger than four. And the reason why clans come into existence is because of our relationships with other indigenous peoples, right? And so when we intermarry, when we create families, when we create bonds, we incorporate those peoples into our existing system of ke. We recognize them as relatives, and we can create names for clans like Ma'ele which probably most likely came from the fact that the Ne people and Walatoa people came together, fell in love, right? Formed community and formed family through that relationality. And so that is my history, right? That's how I describe myself. That is what anchors me as a Diné person is my relationship with and my relationality, right? Not just with Diné people, but also with the people, but also with Hamas Pueblo people and Pueblo people more broadly. And I think that this is important um, because I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Entrada protest. Some of you might have known about this happening on September 8th in Santa Fe because this bringing into, this incorporation of other indigenous peoples into the framework of Ke that the Nez people practice and the fact that I'm, I'm a product of this history, right? I'm a product of the mixing and the, the bonds and the relationships between Diné and Pueblo people. It's not just an interpersonal kind of thing, right? It's not just about our erotic or our familial relationships with one another, but it's also the basis for political affiliation and political affinity. And the reason why I say this is because Roxanne dunbar Ortiz, who delivered a brilliant talk in Santa Fe, some of you may have been there last night, as part of the Lannan Foundation's lecture series, she reminded us in the audience that there were a lot of Diné or Navajo people who came to the aid of Pueblo folks in 1680, right, to help make the Pueblo revolt a success, to kick Spanish colonizers off the land. Of course, we know they came back, but nevertheless, the spirit of Ke, the spirit of our relationship and our, our bonds with each other as Diné and Pueblo people, is partly what made the revolt such a success. And so fast forward uh, to 2017 um, in the Red Nation, um, as some of you may have known, we've been in the media a lot in New Mexico recently because of the arrests, um, particularly of uh, one of the young women, Jennifer Marley, who's from San Ildefonso Pueblo, um, who's one of the lead organizers with our organization, the Red Nation, was arrested and charged with two felonies and five misdemeanors right by the Santa Fe Police Department uh, for protesting the Entrada reenactment, which is part of Las Fiestas, which is this annual celebration in Santa Fe some of you may be familiar with. And the Entrada protest, um, you know, is really a reenactment of what, uh, what the uh, Caballeros de Vargas, which is the sort of the council that sponsors the Entrada, um, talk about as a bloodless, the blood, bloodless reconquest following the 1680 Pueblo revolt. And this is all about history, right? This is how we define history. Because the protest wasn't just, it's not just a bunch of young people screaming, which is how we've been portrayed a bit in the media, but it's really about our indigenous youth reclaiming a history, a history of resistance, and a history that is not afraid to be honest about the fact that colonialism is at the heart of the history of New Mexico, and that colonialism continues to be at the heart of how indigenous peoples are treated, particularly because of resource extraction. And so for something like the Entrada to be celebrated, 
right, which in the Entrada to be narrated a certain way as the bloodless reconquest of Pueblo people is the, actually the opposite of the truth of how history unfolds if we understand the history of the United States, if we understand the history of Spanish imperialism as a history of conquest, right? And a conquest that is still very much ongoing even though we now live under occupation by the United States. And so there have been a lot of media narratives um, um, about how that protest has been portrayed, but I think what's really important um, to, to highlight is that the, the young women uh, who led that protest and who've been leading the effort to abolish the Entrada uh, have developed something, a group that's growing called the Diné Pueblo uh, Youth Alliance. And they spoke at our Indigenous Peoples Day rally on Monday in Albuquerque. But they're this group of really incredible young uh, Diné and Pueblo women from, all, from different Pueblos, not just one. And Diné women from all over um, the Nebuchadnezzar, the Navajo Nation. And what they're doing is they're reforging the relationships and the bonds that Diné and Pueblo people have always had, that I am a product of. And a lot of the coverage of the protests and responses from people, including Diné people and Pueblo people and others in New Mexico who have a stake, right, in how history is told and how we interpret history, has been about division. It's been about, oh, these are a group of, of young native people and white, 